Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Data Integrity and the FDA Guidance. I am Kristen Perregentiel of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. For more information, please visit labroots.com. This event is sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Scientists use Beckman Coulter Life Science Research Instruments to study complex biological problems including causes of disease and potential new therapies or drugs. Their particle characterization business serves biopharma production and QC environments as well as research functions within large biopharma companies. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the green Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Tony Harrison. Tony held the conventorship of the ISO Working Group revising ISO 14698-1 and dash 2 for microbial control in clean rooms and was the UK subject matter expert to the ISO Working Group who issued the 2015 revised versions of the ISO 14644-1 and dash 2 documents for clean room classification at the heart of the aseptic manufacturing chapters of both the European GMP and the USA CMP documents. Tony holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering and is employed by Beckman Culture Life Sciences as a senior marketing manager. Experience in water system TOC, conductivity, and ozone analysis and clean room environmental monitoring, as well as particle characterization, Tony has spent the last 15 years in applied metrology for the pharmaceutical and healthcare manufacturing industries. Prior to that, he worked for companies providing process control automation solutions for manufacturing industries. For Tony's complete bio, please see labroots.com. And Tony, now we turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Tony Harrison from Bagman Coulter. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm going to talk about um, the FDA's uh, 21 CFR Part 11 rule, uh, particularly in the context of clean room environmental monitoring for, uh, and classification for the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry. A recent report that I read uh, suggested that circa 79% of the FDA's 483 warning letters issued um, in 2000, uh, sorry, 2016 to the uh, pharmaceutical industry cited deficiencies in their data integrity. And uh, despite guidance from the FDA, the clean room environmental monitoring remains an intensely manual process with many opportunities for human error to create gaps and errors in the data. In their 21 CFR Part 11 guidance, the FDA have given recommendations on what good data integrity looks like. And this presentation explains their advice in the context of current clean room environmental monitoring practices and shows how the FDA guidance can be applied to improve data integrity. First of all, let's uh, look at some guidance the FDA gives and uh, look at the history behind the 21. CFR rule, uh, Part 11 rule, and also some common misconceptions. In 1997, in the face of pressure by the pharmaceutical industry to move away from paper records and to electronic record keeping, the FDA issued their original 21 CFR Part 11 guidance document on best practice for using electronic records. At that time, the industry was somewhat dismayed 
uh, that the advantages of electronic record keeping appear to be outweighed by the apparently burdensome requirements imposed by this guidance. And there was a lot of pushback against the FDA and their advice. The FDA realized that the pharmaceutical industry were taking their guidance as all-encompassing and, recognizing the need for clarity, they issued further guidance back in 2003. This effectively limited the scope of the 21 CFR Part 11 ruling to those records that are either directly covered by the FDA regulations or those that are submitted to the FDA under the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act of 1938 and the Public Health Service Act of 1944. The FDA's 2003 document provided detailed descriptions of those records where 21 CFR Part 11 should be strictly applied and it dispelled some common misconceptions that may surprise you. The first common misconception is around the use of PDF file type for electronic records. Many people, as I travel around the world, get concerned about the fact that a PDF document could be edited deliberately to hide some sort of quality issue. But that is not the concern that the FDA is trying to uh, address in their guidance. In their 2003 guidance, the FDA sought to make it clear that their uh, sorry, that 21 CFR Part 11 was not written to try to prevent criminal activity. It was actually written to avoid manufacturers accidentally losing or not being able to read their electronic records retrospectively. Many interpret the rules enforcing encrypting encrypted file formats or formats that cannot be deliberately edited. This is not the FDA's intention. Just as with paper records, the FDA intention is that the records should be kept safe and secure so they can be retrieved when required at some point in the future. You can see the excerpt from the FDA guidance on the screen here, and you can see they suggest PDF as one of the file formats. And just as with paper records, it's not the format of the record that the FDA is concerned about. It's the way they are stored to prevent accidental corruption of the information contained in the record or loss of the record itself. For example, electronic records stored in some proprietary format in an archive that only works on a computer, say running Windows XP, for example, they're unlikely to be accessible in 10 years' time, when it will be almost impossible to find a computer that can still run Windows XP. So to prevent such mistakes, uh, the FDA recommends electronic file formats that are designed to be readable on many different platforms. And one of those is, of course, uh, PDF, which, of course, can be read on Windows platform, Apple, Android, etc., etc. Electronic records stored in PDF format are far more likely to be readable in 10 years' time. That being said, of course, the archive where the PDF files are kept should be controlled uh, to prevent accidental or deliberate changes or deletion of the PDF files. The second common misconception is that all computers, all computers and devices used on a pharmaceutical production facility need to comply with the 21 CFR Part 11 rule. This is a, a, a misconception. In their 2003 guidance, the FDA go to great lengths to explain that the only computer that needs to comply with the 21 CFR Part 11 ruling is, in fact, the one where the electronic records are stored. They even go on to point out that if the final records archived and used to demonstrate batch quality to the FDA are stored in paper format, then the 21 CFR Part 11 rule does not apply to any computer, even to the computer used to create the paper record in the first place. I.e., if the final record is kept in paper format and not electronic format, then the 21 CFR Part 11 rule does not apply at all. So let's see, uh, take a look at what other guidance the FDA gives on this topic. 
In their 2003 guidance on the implementation of their 21 CFR Part 11 Data Integrity Rule, the FDA used the acronym ALCOA, where they define good data integrity practice as creating records that are attributable to the technician carrying out the testing, are legible, are created contemporaneously, are original and accurate. This slide shows that the uh, dictionary uh, explanation of attributable, but in this case, the attributable means that the record should be should include an electronic signature to link them to the technician who did the test, and they should also include a label stating where the sample was taken and, of course, have a time and date stamp. The L in Alcoa uh, is legible, and the record, of course, is required to be legible, and that kind of implies that handwritten records are not really acceptable. The FDA goes on to suggest that electronic records should be stored, as I mentioned earlier, in a format that is open and can be read on many computing platforms so that it will be accessible and readable for years to come. The FDA not only recommends PDF, as I've mentioned, but also XML and SGML, which can be read by web browsers. The C in Alcoa is talking about contemporaneously. And contemporaneously, according to the dictionary, means to existing or occurring at the same period of time. And what, what the FDA mean in this instance is that contemporaneously implies that the electronic record should be created immediately the sample is measured, implying that manual transcription of paper records at a later time is not good practice and that collating paper records and then manually transcribing them into an electronic format at a later time or date is, again, not good practice. The O in Alcoa suggests original. The dictionary says the earliest form of something from which copies may be made. Now, in this context, the, um, there's naturally a danger with every transcription of test results from one form to another even scanning multiple paper records into electronic format runs the risk of duplication or even missed scans. So the FDA recommends that the electronic record should be the original record created when the test was completed. Obviously, manually transcribed records are the riskiest, attracting the biggest opportunity for human error. Finally, the A in Alcoa. Naturally, the records should be accurate, of course, it's obvious. And this implies that the process of capturing those electronic records should be robust, i.e. manual calculations, manual data entry, where opportunities for human error exist should be avoided. So that's the Alcoa guidance from the FDA. So let's take a look at this particular rule and guidance in the context of a pharmaceutical clean room environmental monitoring. Of course, the FDA mandates the air quality conditions for pharmaceutical production uh, uh, should maintain certain air quality. In fact, as uh, those in the audience will know, uh, the real danger uh, is not particulates in the air in the clean room, but it's in fact the microbes on the human body Humans shed around 30,000 skin cells per hour, and all of which, of course, are potentially carrying microbes. Unfortunately, we don't have a technology available today which can detect real-time uh, these microbes, so that's why we use air particle counters. In fact, the human body sheds approximately uh, 3.6 kilos of skin per year. <clears throat> Increasingly, the uh, burden of carrying out the environmental monitoring on a daily basis is moving away from the quality control microbiology team over to the production staff. And this is predominantly for two reasons, I've been told. A, of course, the microbiology staff are, unfortunately, relatively expensive to employ. And B, it, of course, reduces the number of people inside the clean rooms because the production staff are already inside the clean rooms. 
So it saves sending extra people into the clean rooms, which could be uh, a source of potential product contamination. However, the downside of this is, of course, the production team do not have the same level of knowledge about routine environmental monitoring and microbiology. And this, uh, I've been told by many people across the world, is creating challenges in itself. Now, as I said at the start of this uh, talk today, that a recent report I read suggests that circa 79% of the 483 warning letters issued by the FDA in 2016 to the pharmaceutical industry cited deficiency in their data integrities, integrity. So uh, this is clearly a, a worldwide problem. In fact, most places I travel to around the world, I see people talking about this issue. 21, sorry, 20 years after the original FDA 21 CFR Part 11 guidance was issued, industry remains very, very focused on ensuring the integrity of the final record. However, many processes leading up to the creation of the electronic record remain intensely manual and paper-based, leading to the opportunity for human errors to create error in the final record or even data gaps. So if we look at the typical clean room monitoring process, that's where everybody focuses, on the electronic record storage. But if, if we think about it, the actual process to get to that electronic record, particularly in clean room environmental monitoring, is intensely manual, using manual SOPs, uh, manual um, programming of the air particle counters, typically um, uh, the paper record from these counters is scanned, and then typically manually transcribed. So you've got those five steps all the way before it gets into the electronic records. So these are the areas where data errors are introduced, data gaps occur. So in my travels around the world, speaking to different production facilities, it's quite common that there are teams of 10 or more technicians whose job it is every month to take thousands of routine environmental monitoring uh, samples. At every location, they have to follow the SOP and manually type the location name into the air particle counter before they start sampling. The counters themselves typically are manually configured following the written SOPs. And at the end of each day, the paper printouts from each sample location have to be photocopied because, of course, the printers on the particle counters are thermal printers, and the printouts fade over time. And then the results from every location have to be manually transferred into electronic format, one by one. As I mentioned, the recent report shows that data integrity is very much at the forefront of the FDA's mind. And, uh, this is, uh, uh, the, sorry, they published their 483 warning letters on the internet, and this is one that I happened to find, um, which actually states that their concerns here with, during a two-year period in a, a sterile grade A um, manufacturing environment, uh, they found that the, there are 846 pieces of environmental monitoring data were not collected or were missing during that time period. So it's very much on the FDA's mind. And the other common theme I'm finding as well is that uh, the FDA is saying that retraining is not the solution. So saying that the reason we've got a problem with our environmental monitoring is because the staff need retraining again. Generally, the FDA is, is not really um, happy with that uh, solution. Um, they're saying, look, by retraining, all you're trying to do is treat the symptoms, and you're not curing the disease. It only works for a short period until human error starts to creep in again. And what they're really suggesting is the correct way forward is to make the process more robust. If we can automate it to eliminate those human error steps, that will, A, make it more uh, reliable and robust, but, B, it will reduce the training burden in the industry as well. So if we take a look at the typical environmental monitoring pro practices in the light of the FDA Alcoa guidance, 
There are many manual steps in the typical environmental monitoring process, and the paper record does not contain an electronic signature. So it's not attributable to the technician. Sample locations are manually typed in for each location, inviting human error and mistyping, preventing the samples being easily attributable to the same lo sample location. And usually, as I mentioned, the record is illegible, but it's certainly not created in a contemporaneous manner. So is it attributable? No, not really. It's not generally linked to the person or the location unless it's manually entered, which, of course, offers the opportunity for human error. Is it legible? The final record? Definitely, yes, it is legible. It's typed into an electronic format, but it's certainly not created contemporaneously. Uh, typically, most people collect the paper printouts over the day when they're doing their routine environmental monitoring and then manually transcribe them at a later time or date. So it's not contemporaneously recorded. It's not the original record either, because the original record from the air particle counter is a thermal printer, and it fades with time. So it's not the original record. Generally, it is accurate, but there's an opportunity for human error to creep in through all these manual steps. And so generally, it's, a, it's not 100% accurate. Now, fortunately, there is a, a solution. Uh, Beckman Coulter have provided a solution for this, um, a fully Alcoa compliant solution. The MET1 air particle counters from Beckman Coulter can have the sampling SOP and locations pre programmed to remove the manual sample location entry and counter configuration steps. Sorry, excuse me. Um, So instead of producing paper records that have to be manually transcribed at a later stage, the counter instantly generates an electronic record that is attributable as it contains the user's electronic signature, the sample location name, and its time and date stamped. The electronic record created is both legible and contemporaneously created, being in one of the recommended formats from the FDA, which, as I mentioned earlier, is PDF. It is the original record, and it's transmitted via wired or wireless Ethernet to the secure server where the files are kept. So this collapses the workflow completely and removes all the manual steps, thus reducing the opportunities for human error and making the record accurate. So as I said, the recent report suggests that 79% of the FDA 483 warning letters in 2016 cited deficiencies in data integrity. And despite that guidance, uh, clean room environmental monitoring remains an intensely manual process. Lots of opportunities for human error to creep in and create gaps and errors in the data. And I'm hearing this on a global basis as I travel around the world. The FDA has given recommendations, the Alcoa recommendation, and what they think uh, good data integrity looks like. And the solution from Beckman Coulter is available uh, to help comply with the Alcoa guidance. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy days. Um, I am ready now. If there are any questions, then I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for that informative presentation, Mr. Harrison. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit your questions by typing them in the green Q&A box, which can be found, found by clicking on the Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question for you today is, you mentioned that PDF is an acceptable file type for electronic records. How can you be sure that the PDF file has not been altered? Yes, certainly. Um, as I mentioned, in fact, the FDA is really less concerned with people deliberately falsifying records than they are really with ensuring that the electronic record will still be legible in years to come. Hence why they suggest the PDF file type. But to answer your question, it is easy to check if a PDF file has been altered 
If you simply right-click on the file, the PDF file, and select Properties, you can check that the date and time that the file was created and the date and time that it was modified are the same. If the file has been modified at some point after it was initially created, then it would show up here in the Properties. Okay, thank you. Why is it important that the electronic record is cre created contemporaneously? Yeah, no, that's a good question, really. And if you think about the uh, the heart of, of, of the problem we're trying to address here, um, it's really human error. In the process of manually handling and transcribing paper records into electronic format, so to reduce the opportunity for human error, the FDA encourages that the instrument taking the measurement creates the electronic record as soon as the measurement is completed, i.e. contemporaneously. And that just removes all those opportunities for human error that can occur in a very manual, clean room environmental monitoring process that we see today. Okay, thank you. Our next question we have, in the Beckman Culture Met One solution, how do you ensure that the electronic record is attributable? No, that's a good question. And, and of course, the FDA is looking that the electronic record is attributable not only to the person or the technician that made the measurement, but also to the location, and it must be time and date stamped where the uh, measurement was made. So the electronic record created by the Beckman Call to Met One solution, it contains all of those attributable pieces of information automatically. Uh, it contains the electronic signature of the user, the location ID, and its time and date stamped. Okay, wonderful. Looks like we may have one more question. Sure. If a particle counter makes an electronic record and receipt printout at the same time, do you need to keep the receipts? Uh, so I, I'm assuming that, that, that the person asking the question, when they say receipt, they're talking about the paper printout from the, um, the particle counter. So it's a, that's a very good question. Um, there, there is an issue, of course. As I mentioned, all particle counters have thermal printers, so the, the receipt or the ticker tape or the piece of paper that it generates from the front of the particle counter, uh, in fact, will fade over time. So trying to keep the original piece of paper is very difficult. It's challenging in itself. So the, the best most people tell me they can do is to photocopy those original um, uh, receipts or ticker tapes from the air particle counter and keep that record too. Now, um, that's a good backup to the electronic record, but once you start duplicating uh, storage of records, it can get uh, complicated, particularly if at some point in time you go back to the records and you find that the electronic record and the paper record don't match. Of course, that shouldn't happen, but potentially it can do. So a lot of people ask us just to remove the, the printer from the MET1 particle counter, so they just take the electronic record and no longer take the paper record and rely on the electronic PDF file that's generated uh, by the particle counter. Wonderful. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Mr. Harrison for his presentation. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, I, I thank everybody for attending today and listening to, to my talk. Um, I believe there's a, a, um, an opportunity to uh, download a white paper on the subject if you're interested, um, and I believe uh, you can do that through a, a replying to the poll question that was sent out a short while ago. Apart from that, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Harrison. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We'll see you next time, and goodbye. Thank you.